Good afternoon. You are listening to Whistle Radio. We are in the Hockey Talk studios this afternoon. This is your host, Mike Humphreys, on Hockey Talk, CIWS 102.7 Whistle Radio. Or check us out on your smartphone and the internet at www.whistleradio.ca, the home and the voice of your Stobo Spirit Junior A Hockey Club. Special guest this afternoon, a son, hockey player, goalie instructor, in time maybe a coach, your favorite goalie in the history of the Stovall Spirit Junior A Club as well as the man who was in net the first time the Stovall Spirit won the Northern Conference. The one, the only, Mr. Dan McQuinney. How are you doing this afternoon, Dan? Really good, really good. What do you think of that introduction, eh? That was good, yeah. You like that? Pump me up, yeah. It was big. <laughs> right it. on. It's huge. Dan, what was it like back in the day? You played in um, 04, 5, 5, 6, right? Yeah. And... Um, what was it like playing for a small town like Stouffville in that time? Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, nerve-wracking coming from uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. You know, it's a completely different world. Uh, but everybody welcomed me in like you wouldn't believe. You know, people were extremely friendly. And, uh, you know, there's people like you around that uh, kind of showed me the ropes and showed me the way uh, how the world works down here. So that was, uh, that was a plus. It was definitely a, a culture shock for me coming from Sault uh, to St. Marie's. So. Yeah, that was my next question. So you grew up in the Sioux your whole life until you were 17, was it? Yeah, uh, basically until I was 17, and then I moved to uh, Terrace Bay, Ontario, which is five hours north of the Sioux, and played for a junior B hockey team there. That was like a, you know, I want to say it was kind of like a, not probably not the best junior league, but you know that's where I got my start into junior hockey. So I can't, uh, I can't. So when did you like? When did you start playing hockey in general? Just hockey. Uh, hockey started probably three, something right. in the three range. My older brother played, and that was just something I wanted to do. So. Right, and I mean I know you weren't always a goalie. So when did you become a goalie? Uh, I started when I was sixteen. Okay, and why? Why it's why so late in your career for average career? It's usually over by eighteen unless you get into men's leagues type thing. I. Uh, I always want to be a goalie. My parents wouldn't let me play. Just what, uh, you know, it's an expensive position. I was a pretty decent forward, my parents tell me. So I guess that's uh, what your parents are. <laughs> they said I was too good to be in net. So whether that was uh, an excuse or not, but I was, uh, so that basically, I always wanted to do it and they wouldn't let me. And then uh, I had my opportunity in high school. I was sitting in uh, grade 10 engineering uh, shop class and uh, a coach of the hockey team came in and was talking to somebody and asked, said, hey, have you ever played goalie before? And he was like, well, no. And I was kind of like, yeah, i played goalie before. <laughs> <laughs> so then they uh, randomly are like, all right, you know, it's sight unseen. Yeah, sure, we'll sign you up. They got me, put me, uh, put me on skates and put me in this uh, set of 1950s, 1960s <laughs> goalie gear that they had in the back closet somewhere because I didn't have any of my own. And I went up for practice and obviously... I was a street hockey goalie all my life, so that's as far as my uh, my pad saves went. So it was kind of, they didn't have anyone else. They said, yeah, sure, I guess, whatever, you know, so. Well, I mean, it's quite an accomplishment to go from high school and the next year you went to Junior B, right? Yeah, I started that Junior B. So I was just, a, it had to be, the way I started, I had to be bang, 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 you know, I had to be sharp on my game and, you know, it was no, I couldn't make a mistake. I couldn't have a bad year. I couldn't, you know, slack off in my training. It was just like, I had to be bang here, climb the ladder as quick as possible. It was, time was running out at that point in time. So. Yeah, you were getting older, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so all the way through your career, you wanted to be a goaltender. Yeah. And w did you have a uh, goaltender that you idolized as you were growing up? Who would who would have been that kid? I don't know. It's strange to say for some reason I've always <laughs> idolized Dan Kluche. He didn't even have a long career, but I used to watch him in uh, in the Sioux the, for the Greyhounds in the o right. OHL. It was just my favorite goalie watching. He was scrappy and tough, and you know I liked that too. So mm -hmm. in juniors, I modeled my game after him a little bit. Right. I was a little bit of a, a feisty goalie, but yes. uh, definitely have settled down now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, <clears throat> obviously when you played here, one of the big things that uh, I've mentioned already is winning the Northern Conference uh, in Stouffville, which was a huge feat for us. Uh, do you remember who got the last goal? Uh, yeah, I actually, I want to say like a, an Ian Brunt kind of a guy, but uh, I don't recall. You don't no. recall? You don't remember Randy Johnson's... Uh... Oh, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. It was very... Uh, it was a big problem, I believe. They, they were not happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've run into uh, 
playing uh, Nathan Oak, who played on that team, and I played with him uh, two years ago and then against him a couple years, and he still talked about that and how it was garbage that they got a penalty. You know, he, he knew for sure they should have won that game and all this and that, and so he was still upset about it. <laughs> that made me laugh. Anyway, I, I don't know. I just stopped the puck. Yeah, and, and when you were here in Stroville, obviously you moved around a little bit uh, from Billets to uh, the general manager's house, yeah. and uh, you ended up at our place uh, knocking on the door looking for a meal before game time from yeah. time to time, yeah. Yeah. as we were having fun about that last night. Um, just, um, you know, what, what did that whole transition do for you as a human being and, and growing up for those two years? Um, was it a, obviously I think it was a good experience for you, but did you learn a lot being on your own a little bit more? and? being away from home and all that? I, as soon as I left uh, when I was 17, it was here. My first junior year, junior B, I was put into a place with a guy and it was just, you know, here, here you are. He's gonna buy you groceries when you need it. And that's, you know, that was it. So I was 17, I had my own room, I had my own snowmobile that got me around town <laughs> and I had uh, Oreos and packs of bacon. <laughs> that was, you know, that was my main meal was, uh, okay, I get hungry, I'll make a pack of bacon, I guess, because that's what you do when you're alone, when you're 17, you have no idea. So uh, then same thing, going to Stouffville, I had a more family-oriented people around me, which is very nice, and it's nice that, you know, you start considering other people, your moms and dads, you kind of, you know, second to them, and, you know, things, you, uh, you're adolescent, you make silly mistakes, and you do silly things, and, uh, you know, obviously I was guilty for a few things, and moved to billet and then uh, finally settled in with uh, with you guys I guess and that was uh, a, a whole other change you know and now again a different world but uh, I learned you know more values and more helping out and uh, definitely in terms of being in this house was probably one of the best things that could have happened for me for sure just with all the all the things that um, I learned more values wise and uh, you know lifestyle and you know more or less how to how to live your life without telling me how to live it but you know giving me some pretty good guidelines on yeah it. Oh, very nice thank you um did you have a nickname through your minor hockey career or was it the same one or is it one that you had or one that you shared with the guys or did they have one for you a nickname uh you know there was never really there was never really any cool nickname i had like well not cool but like squirt or you know any skinny yeah i never had a it was always you know it always went to quinter it was always quinter you know, it's, i've had a million nicknames and a million people but they pulled that out of my last name somehow and that was it so. yeah <laughs> so. now what do you um in saying all that what um um what do you what are you going to do for a living dan moving forward i know you've been playing some pro hockey for a little while so maybe you want to kind of uh, tell us about that you left stoville and you went where uh, I left Stouffville. I did the uh, making the cut that summer after mm -hmm. Stouffville, and that was, uh, you know, pretty exciting, crazy experience. And uh, I went over. I uh, got a call from the Fort Wayne Comets in the UHL, which was basically Double A pro hockey, and that's, uh, you know, the next level above that is the AHL and then the NHL. So it was, uh, I was pretty excited. And at the same time, I had uh, some scholarship opportunities. Uh, I lost some uh, big ones, not being able to go to D1. And uh, a lot of that contributed contrib back to being in high school and not knowing that, you know, at 16, it was like, I was in high school kind of, you know, smoking, whatever, being a cool guy, you know, being a class clown and all that, not knowing that, you know, I could have had an opportunity to go to one of the best D1 hockey programs in, you know, all of North America. <laughs> yeah. In North America. Yeah. I still, when I mention it to some guys are like, yeah. If you would have went to North Dakota, you probably would have had a position in the AHL as soon as you got out. And it's like, but, you know, that's the way it is. And I had D3 opportunities and I saw pro hockey lights flashing in my eyes. And I thought, that's, no, that's what I want to do. I didn't want to have to pay to go to school and have loans and that, even though I was a scholarship. But so I did that. I, I played for seven, eight years. I've seen most of the United States, really. I mean, I've been everywhere. I've had it. I would never. I would never go back and change it. But uh, if I could, I definitely. I would definitely do school. But that's. Uh, I've had so many good experiences and met so many wonderful people that. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, it's been amazing. Now it's starting to wrap itself up a little bit. Um, the money's decent, but eventually you want to live a normal life. We want to be able to have our weekends and you know work nine to five Monday to Friday and then have your weekends and. 
So I'm looking at, uh, I've been working auto mechanic stuff for a long time. I, uh, I guess I apprenticed off of my girlfriend's dad. I held on to him for about four years and just held on his coattails and learned everything I could from him. So he's been uh, uh, another, you know, again, another guy along your journey that's just kind of, you know, just trained me, given me another life skill that uh, I would have never had without a guy like that. So mm -hmm. that was, uh, so I'm looking at auto mechanics for a, for a career and, uh, you know, maybe the aeronautical field just depends on whatever I'm going to get paid the most in, you know, I mean, <laughs> either way it's all nuts and bolts. So, yeah, very good. Everybody you're listening to CIWS Whistle Radio 102.7 and you check us out on the internet at whistleradio.ca and we're the home and the voice of your Stobo Spirit Junior A Hockey Club. And this afternoon we're in conversation with the one, the only Mr. Dan McQuinney, who was the goalie when the Spirit won the first time a Northern Conference title and a North, Northwest, Northwest Conference, East, yes, Northwest, Dan, I know you reminded me of that yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, obviously, a lot of excitement when Dan played here. Dan uh, was a bit of a character, um, as uh, his stay in Stouffville was. Uh, Dan is outspoken and uh, has lots to say in a positive way, and uh, jokes a lot of fun about uh, himself in uh, the basis of, um, I guess, just sharing your sense of humor and... Uh, you know, last night you mentioned it again, and we all had a good chuckle about it, about uh, that, you know, you're a big deal kind of down in these towns <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So, and you've also done some radio and some uh, commercials and yeah, big time. stuff like that. What, you want to share some of those experiences with us? Uh, this, uh, you know, I had an opportunity just this past season to go on the radio. Uh, generally, they hadn't really thrown anybody on the radio for the last three years in Huntsville, and they were looking for somebody to do it. And of course, I was like, radio, yeah, sure, you know, <laughs> for sure. So I, uh, I jumped on that opportunity, and uh, next thing you know, the radio station, the sister station that was in the same building as them, said, yeah, well, we'd like to have him on too. And it actually started becoming a battle between the two. So that was kind of cool watching them like, well, no, we want him this day, and we want him this day, and this and that. So. You know, anybody arguing over you for your radio personality is kind of cool so but I I enjoyed that uh, immensely it was a, a learning experience to see how radio worked and then just being able to do some of the things I did head, headphone karaoke and goofy things a headphone karaoke that put uh, headphones over your ears and you can hear the music but everyone else is just listening to you sing so <laughs> so I was uh, there's a couple of those out there and uh, did a lot of little game things and woke people up and called them and you know did some funny stuff. So that was that was uh, that was a great experience. I love doing that. Um, commercials did a bunch of commercials down in Huntsville. You know hockey advertising in general. Um, That's Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, yeah. sorry. It's uh, it's been I've been there for the last three or four years, so it's kind of a common thing to say Huntsville. But right now, I, I understand. Obviously, you've been traded from Huntsville. Yeah, and you're going to play for uh, the Mississippi River Kings now. Okay, so and I think you're excited about getting a change in color. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> since I ever since I've actually played uh, my hockey goalie career, um, I've been seven, probably seven of my nine teams have all been black, red, and white. Oh, yeah. So this team's uh, black or uh, green, gold, and white. So okay. uh, <laughs> exciting uh, just to have a change of color. Get um, some new equipment to match, of course. Yeah, always new, very good. New very set good. of gear every year. That's uh, yeah. That's way. It wears out that much, does it? <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess it's more of a. It does wear out, and a lot of it is a status thing for me. It, it feels just good to get new gear every year, and you know, it's just part of uh, part of what I get in my contract every year. So right on. Just, and what is it that you do with the old stuff? Uh, generally, sometimes I hold on to it. Sometimes I sell it to people that you know need it and that kind of stuff. Um, this past season, I got, I guess I got more involved with the uh, Melissa George Foundation, and it is in Huntsville, Alabama, and it's uh, neonatal care. And uh, just I love kids, so they. Uh, I was talking to them and asked them last year when I was in New Jersey if they would auction off my helmet. Uh, it was one of my masks I had painted and it was uh, a Disney mask so it had all sorts of characters on there from uh, oh, gee, I, all the Disney characters you can think of. So I ended up uh, talking to Chris George who's the uh, owner of that and he uh, said go ahead, you know, I'd love to, you're a little far away, let's wait. So I ended up going back to Huntsville and so right away I knew the start of the season, I was like alright Chris I want to do this. Uh, auctioned my helmet off at the end of the game and it had gone for 1800 bucks and uh, 
the guy turned around and re re put it up for re auction. So they re auctioned again and uh, it doubled, almost tripled. So that was uh, amazing to, you know, and all the money out. went to the cause. All the money went to the cause, yeah. yeah. So and a, a fan that uh, uh, were good friends of mine were actually people that bought it and they spent a lot of money on it and they knew that it was, uh, you know, it was special to me, but and it was also special to them and special to charity and all that. So that was awesome. You know, if I, I wish I could do more stuff like that, but. Right now, you've won a few things over the years. What would be the biggest thing that you won as far as a hockey player? As a hockey player, I, you know, that that pro, that first pro championship that uh, no one thought we would win. You know, we were underdogs, uh, third or fourth seed. Uh, you know, we picked up a couple of decent players before the playoffs, and all of a sudden we gelled, and no one thought we were going to make it. And then it was just like bang, 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 and you know, championship. So it was uh, very exciting. It was uh, one of the best experiences I've ever had. Now, did you not win MVP in that? that I the, also did win playoff MVP, and I didn't want to start bragging too early. <laughs> all my awards, but oh uh, come on, man! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know well, you're uh, better than that. <laughs> so you've had, you've had a few awards, have you? Yeah, uh, last year in the FHL was uh, goalie of the year, um, playoff MVP, and uh, I was the team MVP. Uh, last year I was my team MVP, so that was a plus. Uh, I've been a playoff MVP when we won the championship, and again we won another championship last year. Uh, so it's just been you know, awards. I won a lot of community service awards just for you know doing things for the community. You know anything. You know you call me and I'm there. So mm -hmm. it's uh, been extremely fun. The radio station was another thing. You know it just it helps promote things you're helping promote different causes and this and that and you know you get your voice out there for things you want to say so it's kind of cool yeah yeah um what was the biggest disappointment you figure in your hockey career that you've uh, run into i guess uh, i was almost like the feeling of uh it wasn't a helplessness but um when i tried to move up in my career uh, i was playing double a but i wanted to play at the double a level that had more farm teams and chances to be called up and uh that was something that uh it didn't work uh being undrafted was extremely tough to get up there and i felt like i had earned my spot and i was there and you know, i was better than the rest and uh drafted guy probably a week into the season got sent down and that was it for me and then i went since I didn't have a team in another league to go to and they were all set, it was like bounce from this team, then back home and then over to this team. And it was just, uh, it was a, a frustrating time. And uh, a lot of my hopes and dreams, I just, I don't know what it was. I kind of just lost my passion, a big time passion for wanting to move up just because I was just like that first rejection. And I, I took it hard and I kind of, uh, instead of using it and going the other way, I kind of was like, well, you know, I'd rather be in a more secure area than have to do that again. And you know, I always had long-term relationships. So that it was also hard to balance in all of that. You know, if you're a single guy, it's moving anywhere, driving anywhere, packing up a suitcase and going is easy. But if you have a girlfriend, you have a live-in and all of that. It's uh, it makes it a lot tougher on your life, but you know, that's the way it is. And like, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything, but, uh, you know, it would have always been nice, and you hear any pro hockey player say it, it probably would have been nice to have a, a chance to move up, you know, play at a higher level, and see if you see if he could have hacked it up there. But you know, we'll never know. So, now, do you get big fans out to your games? Yeah, always. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama is one of the best places I played for fans. Uh, I four, five, six grand in a in a decent sized arena. You know, that's packed, full house, so it's uh, loud, very loud. Uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Biggest crowd by far. I played in front of uh, 10,500 people. Wow. Just, uh, you know, little melees break out. Everybody's on their feet cheering, screaming. My ears are like, I was playing and I was like, wow, this is loud. Hey, it gives you goosebumps and all that stuff. So, very cool to come out to stuff like that. You people cheering your name and all that is uh, pretty cool. <laughs> it's a great feeling for sure. So, I guess in that, you've obviously met a lot of fans that um, looking for autographs and all that stuff. Was that exciting? <laughs> always uh, you know it's uh, part of the game and you know sometimes <laughs> after a loss it's tough sometimes but you know it comes it comes with the territory and most of the time it's unbelievable uh, it's cool to have 
kids wanting your autograph and kids, uh, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like Dan McQueen. And it's like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like me? I don't know. <laughs> Have you seen how much I make? <laughs> Try something else, but uh, but now it's cool to have you know just kids and stuff like that that are that think you're something big, and that's always uh, that's always cool. From junior all the way up, that was the biggest thing. And then when you get to professionals, they think you're a really big deal. And like, well, I'm not really, but uh, trying to put some money together to fix my truck if you have any extra cash laying around, but. And, uh, well, everybody, you've been listening to Whistle Radio. This is Mike Humphreys, your host on Hockey Talk at CIWS 102.7 Whistle Radio. You can check us out on the internet at whistleradio.ca. I thank Dan for his time this afternoon, and we're going to have him back for another show quite soon. Dan, thanks very much, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. You're listening to Whistle Radio. We're in the Hockey Talk studios. This is your host, Mike Humphreys, on Hockey Talk, CIWS 102.7 Whistle Radio. Or check us out on the internet, whistleradio.ca. We're your home and the voice of your Stovall Spear Junior A Hockey Club. Our special guest this afternoon here for his second visit. He's not only a son, pro hockey player, goalie instructor, in time, maybe a coach. Your favorite goalie in the history of the Stovall Spear Junior A Hockey Club, as well as the man who was in net the first time the Spirit won the Northern Conference. The one, the only, Mr. Dan McQuinney. How are you doing this afternoon, Dan? Good, good, good. Cue the clapping, please. Yeah. Cue the clapping. <laughs> uh, that doesn't work here. We don't have that uh, <laughs> okay, technology okay, yet. Okay. It is Stowville, remember? <laughs> yeah, I understand. <laughs> Always a good introduction. Anyways. Yeah. So we've been talking a little about uh, your pro hockey career and some fans and stuff like that. And obviously, um, yesterday we were talking about uh, things such as... Um, Twitter accounts, and I know there's been a lot of, uh, you know, with social media nowadays, exactly what we're doing right here. Yeah. Um, you know, have you had some problems with it? Has it been a good thing to get lots of followers and all those things and Facebook and stuff? You know, do you want to share that with us? Uh, always. It's been, uh, it's always been pretty positive for me. I haven't had any problems. There's always, uh, you know, there's always fans that maybe take it a little too far, but, you know, that's, uh, I've been, uh, I've been guilty for that myself for certain things, you know, being crazy fans of things. But uh, yeah, it's it's always been pretty positive. There's never, never. It's it's a helpful tool. It's good to know some of the people, you know, instead of just you see somebody at a game and you know you see 10, 15 other people and you forget those people's names and you know they add you on Facebook later and then you're able to you know talk with them after and that's kind of the nicer thing about being in a a minor pro system is that. You know, you you're a lot closer with all the fans than anywhere else, so they can meet you after the game and all that. But uh, Twitter, Twitter's been good. I got my first account this year. They uh, set us up in Huntsville, Alabama, and we ended up. You know, we had a small contest there, kind of like an unspoken contest, and everybody wanted to see who get the most followers. So it's kind of like a everybody was throwing a lot of tweets out there. You know, do this, do that. So everyone. Uh, Kind of by the end of the year, I was I was still keeping tabs. I don't know if anybody else was, but I definitely was. So I ended up I ended up doing pretty good. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, uh, but it was uh, it was high. I was pumped up about it. Yeah. It was, so uh, you had the most, did you? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. So, but yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, in our last interview, I meant to ask you, um, you know, when you played here in Stouffville in the Junior A team, um, why do you think that team had success? Uh, I want to say, uh, me, no, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, see, I expect that from yeah, you, Dan, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was a lot of guys that we had, a, a, I don't know if we had the most talented team, but we had a, a tight knit group of guys and everybody liked each other. Everybody's friendly. Uh, we, uh, had a lot of good team parties. Everybody hung out. Uh, we had a couple key guys, uh, a couple guys that you wouldn't have thought would have made something bigger now but uh you know that are all of a sudden bloom but it was just a good all-around team you know who and, would those guys be uh definitely like a guy like will acton you know bloomed uh like you wouldn't believe uh simon geisbers uh had a load of talent there uh once he got his uh i think once he got his gazelle legs underneath him and got them <laughs> figured out he was uh he was good to go he's a bit bambi legged out there but uh definitely by far Probably the hardest shot I've seen 
in all my pro career would be through Simon. So and I'm sure it's harder than it is oh, harder kinda, now. I thought it would have been me, Dan, in the driveway. That <laughs> yeah, one time, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? no, one of those five thirty <laughs> in the morning skates. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when we when you guys got to the Northern Conference and the excitement and all of that, uh, the fans. I guess that must have been pretty exciting. You know, obviously just living in Stowa for a few years, but just having that success in this community. What do you think it meant to the community? Uh, I. I was hoping it would be huge. I believe it was. It made me uh, going around town, you know, hey, you were the one that did all the championship stuff. We, you know, we did a little bit of parading and that. And, uh, you know, I think it brought, uh, I mean, for a lot of the fans, I'm sure it brought back a lot of confidence in the team as well. You know, it's, uh, you uh, people want to be involved with uh, success. And I believe that uh, that, that kind of, uh, you know, a lot of people rallied around that. And, uh yeah, I want to say it was a big building block for the team, and uh, we were a big part of that. So, so I was disappointed when I heard they won the championship, but also happy. But now but they that, won, what, in, in, they, in 2011. Yeah, in 2011. So they won the big championship. So that kind of overshadowed what all of us had done now, <laughs> right? So it's just uh, it's like someone else coming along and breaking your records, and you know now you're number two. So what was the biggest surprise that year? If you think there was one, I mean, maybe winning that last game or. And to get the Northern Conference to get the one hurdle, or I guess, yeah, I, did. I feel like that whole thing was a surprise. You know, it's like, yeah, we're not. I believe we went through three series where we were down three one and came back. So it's like yeah. every time you thought we were out, we would come back and do something great. And I don't know what it was, but that was. I think that that made it what this series was. That made it what the championships were all about. That we were always down. We were never. We never dominated a series. It was always us battling, just making it harder on ourselves. It was always that kind of stuff happening. So when you overcome more, the more adversity you overcome, the better that stuff is. So that was uh, that was huge. I, pretty well every series was uh, amazing. But the first time we won that North Conference Championship, it was something that hadn't been done. Uh, it was something we thought we wouldn't do because we had come back several times from being down, being down in the series. Yeah, I was kind of like, oh, well, here we go. You know, let's just play this game. And then it was like a win. And it was like, well, I guess, you know, we win two more. We have a chance. And you win one, and then you're in the you're in the championship game. And then you're like, wow, if we win this one, we win the championship. You know, and then we move on and we keep playing. And, you know, that's a good part. So it's... Uh, that was the the first championship we won was by far the biggest I think and uh, you know the the second the Northwest was huge but it still didn't feel good as that first we expended every ounce of energy we had on that first we wanted to get that one big step in you know that was the first big step we wanted to take and we did it and then uh, you know we came down three one being in uh, Georgetown or Oakville. I believe it was Oakville. Oakville. Yeah, Oakville, it was yeah. Oakville. And we were down 3 1 in that one, and no one expected us to win that. And we won that. He came back and then won, and then uh, it was just like another, oh my God. But by that time, we were so exhausted that you know, nobody wanted to party. It was like, yeah, all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's keep going now. We're, we're this far, and let's keep going. So. Now, I always wondered if you had a sponsor behind the scenes, uh, McDonald's perhaps, with your <laughs> nickname when they. They quoted you on that. Um, what was that called? That form forty-five or something? Yeah, I, and uh, they called you Dan McNettoff. Yeah, you know, that stuff was cool. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a. It, you have grown-up people, and you're nineteen, twenty years old, and you know there's a bunch of people talking about you, and you know making rumors, and it. You know you get that pro feel like you're kind of a big thing, but. Uh, it was the the McNedoff that that took off. Um, that I guess would have to be my signature, one of my signature things in junior hockey. That was. Uh, now, were you doing that on purpose? Do you think from sometimes? Because yeah. I know your sense of humor and your, you oh. know, your your banter with the refs and stuff like that at times. Uh, or was it just a fact that uh, Stouffville, uh, the pegs just weren't in there solid? Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, I think it was a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, I think it was more of a 60-40 kind of a thing for me knocking the net off. Uh, but it was something. It's a part of the game, you know. <laughs> Goalies will find you know, ways to uh, use that as a use that as a I guess a tool, and it was. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a guy coming to wrap around, slide across, knock the net off. So if he scores, it's no goal, and if he passes it across, and you're down and out, and that guy scores, no. You know, it doesn't count. You know, that's uh, it's, uh, pretty greasy for sure. And now I see goalies do it. Younger guys will do it in our league sometimes. And 
try and pop it off and you know we have the bigger moorings and all that but you know guys still do it and it's still like really come on man grow up and then i have to remember <laughs> that i did it too but now that uh, i'm older in the game it's annoying you know you see i used to be a big uh i used to like diving you know i, I was a big fan of that goading guys into penalties and now I see guys doing it now, and I'm like, really? Come on, have some respect for the game, and come on, it, act like you're 20 years old, you know, act like you've played before and all this, and I got all the chirps, but you know, I did the exact same thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, you're listening to CIWS 102.7 Whistle Radio. You can check us out on the internet at whistleradio.ca, and we're the home and the voice of your Stovall Spirit Junior A Hockey Club, and this afternoon... Our special guest is the one and only Mr. Dan McQuinney that we were in conversation with. And um, Dan, one other question I always wanted to ask you, um, and I, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but we were playing a game, I believe it was against Aurora, and um, Aurora was making a line change, and I believe it was in the playoffs, and you, the puck was dumped down, you took it and shot it right at their bench along the ice, and they ended up getting a penalty for too many men on the ice. Do you remember that? Yeah, and that was, uh, they were uh, outraged. They were... <laughs> That's uh, one of the, that's one of those other things, you know. You uh, there it nowadays it's tough to do with the new rules, but back then, you know, you saw a line change, you fired it into their bench. <laughs> one of their guys hits one of their skates, and you know, there two you minutes. So you got to use you got to use what you have in your toolbox, and that was just one of those things. <laughs> oh, the puck came to me, and I looked, and they were changing, and I happened to hit somebody's skate, and next thing you know. And then, of course, you know, the refs are younger. They're developing as well. So everybody's going to make mistakes. Whether that was a mistake or not, I don't know. So. Now, the coach, do you remember who the coach was? It For them? Yeah. Yeah, it was Jerome, uh, Jerome uh, DuPont. DuPont, yeah. You know, he was an NHL player, obviously. And uh, I don't think he was too happy about that. No, not at all. <laughs> I think I uh, that whole season, plus the playoffs, I did nothing but get under that guy's skin. And he terrified me. <laughs> he definitely was a scary guy, but... Uh, I would never let him see that again when we beat them. He uh, wrote an amazing article in the paper, you know, gave me huge kudos to how well I played. And so that was cool after all that battling we had done. And we had real, I remember uh, a regular season game when we were down, uh, I was like 4 3 or something. And he was, uh, he was chirping me from the bench and this and that. And we came back and uh, we tied it 4 4. And I remember every single goal we scored after that, we beat them 7 4. And every time I would skate to their blue line in front of their bench, waiting for our guys to come and high five, and I would just stand there and smack my stick on the ice every time they <laughs> scored. Eh? So he, I think he was ready to jump the bench a few times. But uh, it's always funny when you can get under the skin of somebody uh, as, as high of a, a status as that, I guess. Yeah. Well, he'd be, he's pretty animated on the bench. And I, on the, I was sitting there looking at him. Boy, he was... He was not a happy camper. No, he was, he uh, he was a livid fellow. Yeah. I've actually uh, ended up playing against his son along the way through pro hockey. Team. Oh, yeah? yeah. Right on. But, uh, right yeah. On. That was cool. Now, you know, over the years, you've had many coaches, assistant coaches, and trainers, and uh, obviously people behind the scenes and stuff like that. And so in Stouffville, you must have had a, a coach that you uh, maybe you liked or you had maybe uh, didn't feel as comfortable with or something like that. Do you want to share? Any comments about the coaching you had in Stovo? Uh, coaching, yeah, my first year uh, going, I guess I'll, I'll go through the list of guys. The, the first year I had Brian Perrin uh, and Jeff Perrin was kind of in the background a little bit on that. And uh, you know, Brian was a, a goalie himself, so he definitely wasn't the easiest guy on goalies. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't have a personality like I did to just, you know, Whatever you had on your mind, it was coming out of your mouth and that kind of stuff. He was pretty. Uh, he was a pretty quiet guy, so he's definitely a tough coach to read. And I've had coaches like that that are quiet. And for me, it just it kills me because it just has my mind racing all the time. What's he thinking? Is he mad? Is he not mad? What did I do wrong? Am I doing well? Am I not doing well? You know. So you don't know, but that's just the different coaches you run into. Uh, Dan West, uh, younger guy. Uh, I respected him a lot. Uh, you know, he helped my game out quite a bit, even though I believe, I think they want to get rid of me at the start of that year. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm glad they kept me, but, you know, that's just uh, part of the game again, and, you know, it's a decision that they made for me to stay, and obviously it worked out for both of us. Uh, they, uh, that guy uh, that obviously sticks out, sticks out in Stouffville Huge is uh, Patty Madigan. Um uh, 
I played in the one tournament that they had. I know they've had more than that, but uh, he was a guy that you know, I always remember all the stuff he said and all this, uh, all his sayings and all his funny quirks and stuff that he did. He was an amazing man, and he was an amazing man to me, and uh, you know taught me a ton of stuff. Uh, I have nothing but great memories. Uh, the towel, I had got a towel from him uh, a long while back in one of the tournaments, and uh, I still have it in my hockey bag to this day just to... Uh, you know, remind me that he's still around and all that. So he's uh, that was probably one of the biggest guys, I guess, uh, influence. Uh, anytime I had a problem, he was always the guy to I talk to, come to. Anytime, you know, <laughs> I uh, I used to sleep in too much. I used to sleep in uh, and stay up all night. And he was the first guy that said, "All right, well, we're gonna get you a job." And you know, he put me in a job that I hated. So it. Uh, you know, it was brutal, but again, a huge lesson. No different than uh, working with uh, Mr. Michael Humphreys here, doing uh, moving the office furniture. You know, that's your your biggest. I believe he's taught a bunch of people this lesson. But uh, you know, here's your uh, if you uh, if you don't want to do this the rest of your life, you better go to school. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Was, uh, but big... you didn't do that. You didn't listen very well. No, but, uh, I was yeah, young and young and naive. Things so. are working out. Yeah, things are working out. Um, you know, so I was curious on your comments on Kenny Burroughs. I mean, he's been the GM uh, many years. Uh, he's left since you've uh, left. He's been back, and now he's one of the owners of the team. What, what's your comments on Kenny? You can be truthful. Strange to see. Uh, he was uh, he was a different guy. You know, I was. Uh, I don't know if I was always intentionally trying to get under his skin, but I think <laughs> I did quite a bit. Uh, uh, obviously, time has gone by now, and whatever happened happened, but. You know, I've always found him to be a, a very, uh, I don't know, extremely t simple guy. You know, you're always getting only one side of Kenny. You get one side of Kenny and it's the, you know, extremely serious face and uh, whatever, you know. If he doesn't want to be here, then get him out of here kind of a guy. So he's uh, he's a different different character. Um, I don't know if he'd ever be a guy I'd sit down with and, uh, you know, have a beer on a regular Friday night with him. But uh Definitely a guy I would catch up with and uh, be okay not to see for a year and come back and catch up with him again. So, right but uh, that was just our relationship. So <laughs> we never uh, we didn't see eye to eye on a ton of things. So. Right, right. Now, um, you know, now in talking about those things, have you ever thought of maybe uh, getting involved with a team in time uh, as a coach or assistant coach or management? Uh, always uh, like that. Always thought about it. I just. Uh, you know, I guess you have to see where everything leads. I I like to be a coach, but I'd like to do it uh, at a professional level. Uh, obviously, you have to work your way up and that thing. But it's a very cool idea. Uh, I don't know if I'd make a good head coach because of my personality, but uh, definitely an assistant coach. And you know, maybe if I get older and uh, ever get more mature, maybe that's a better position for me. But uh, being the assistant coach, I think I'd uh, have a lot more value and. Being able to open up, uh, have younger guys open up to me, talk to me, ask me questions, and uh, you know, relay messages to the head coach, and uh, you know, keep the peace and all that stuff, and keep it light. You know, I've always been known through my pro hockey days that was one of my biggest assets is that uh, you know I know when to be serious and I know when to keep it light, and you know, when things get crazy, a lot of times I I keep the dressing room light and I keep people loose, and that's just you know always been part of my personality. So. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Um, now, if if you were ever to do that, do you think you'd move back to Canada to maybe be a coach first, or do you think you're going to stick it out in the states? Uh, it's uh, you know, it's a toss up. Uh, I have a great girlfriend right now. Uh, you know, most likely going to be getting engaged, married, all that stuff, uh, all that bad stuff. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, it depends on where our lives take us, I guess. Uh, she's always probably gonna have a better job than me so she'll take priority in what she wants to do and where she wants to go but uh, you know it'll be uh, a year by year decision and see where where we end up if there's stuff that starts opening up and opportunities like that for sure I Canada's the Canada is the hockey capital so I if I wanted to do anything like that it'd be uh, it'd be in Canada but you never know what can happen 5 10 15 years from now so that's for sure that's for sure yeah, I'm just uh, you know, kind of changing the subject just a smidge here. Um, what do you think about the fact that girls hockey is one of the fastest growing sports in Canada? I believe that it is a hundred percent. The fact that uh, they struggle to find girls hockey, and now you know it's becoming huge, and scholarships are flying out everywhere. Uh, I think it's unbelievable for. Uh, 
uh, I completely, I don't know. I, I just think that uh, it's good. It's a great thing. I don't. That's uh, scholarships is, you know, that's <laughs> what it's all about. Really, yeah. at the end of the day. So that's uh, that's huge for the girls, and that's that should be a main one of the main. Yeah, they love playing, but definitely being able to go to school for free is uh, is huge. So. Yeah. Okay, Dan. Well, thank you very much for your time this afternoon, everybody. You're listening to Whistle Radio. I'm your host. Mike Humphreys on Hockey Talk. This is CIWS 102.7 Whistle Radio. You can check us out on the internet at whistleradio.ca. And we're the home and the voice of your Strobel Spirit Junior A Hockey Club. Dan, thanks very much for your time, and we'll have you back once again. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am your host, Mike Humphreys, and you're listening to Hockey Talk on CIWS 102.7 Whistle Radio, or check us out on the internet at whistleradio.ca. We're the home and the voice of your Strobel Spirit Junior A Hockey Club. Our special guest today is not only a son, pro hockey player, goalie instructor, in time maybe a coach, your favorite goalie in the history of the Strobel Spirit Junior A Hockey Club, as well as the man who was in net the first time the Spirit won the Northern Conference. The one, the only, Mr. Dan McQuinney. How are you doing this afternoon, good. Dan? Never get tired of hearing that. So it's good. <laughs> I might have to uh, put that on a repeat play of my headphones before games or something like that. <laughs> Very good. Um, now, Dan, we've had you in a couple of times, obviously, and um, these shows are all obviously pre-recorded. But I'm wondering what you would like to share to our audience who are obviously going to be listening to a spirit game this afternoon, or it could be a Thursday night game when this is uh, uh, put out there. But I'm just curious on uh, what you would like to share about your experiences as a spirit player, um, something that maybe I haven't asked you, um, or a comment that you have about the town of Stouffville or the team itself. Um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, I guess, a second home to me. You know, this is a place that uh, I love coming back to. I love the town. I love the people. You know, there was always uh, there was always somebody in the stands willing to do whatever they could for you to help you as a young guy and. Uh, you know that even uh, the young fans that are still still around today that are helping out, but uh, the the people were amazing. The fans were great. You know, we had such a great following through that whole championship stuff, and you know everybody kind of stood by us. Even the people that uh, stood through those years of uh, maybe not being so successful, and you know they had a, a big part in that championship uh, and all that. So it was, uh, you know. I, I, you know, I enjoyed playing here, and like I said, it's like a second home to me, and it's cool to go through town and see, you know, I can't go anywhere without running into somebody I know, somebody through hockey, somebody who's helped me, you know, somebody I've been able to help, so it's, uh, you know, like I said, this town's like a second home to me, and uh, I always feel, always feel welcome coming here. Yeah, very good. Now, Dan, tell us something about yourself that we don't know, something that I probably may not ask you this afternoon. Is there something about you you want to share with uh, our radio world? Uh, I don't know. I'm uh, a big hunter fisherman. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen that. Uh, if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. Um, I don't know. I guess. No, no, I don't have anything. No, nothing. No, okay. I don't know. You, you are a pretty guy who's out there. You always uh, kind of talk and show uh, the type of person you are. So um, I'm going to change around the questions here a bit. What or did you ever get cut from a team? Uh, yes, uh, my, th I guess my third year pro when I wanted to go and play in the East Coast, that was my big, that was my big cut that hurt, that hurt me, hurt my career, I felt like, uh, hurt me mentally, and that was, uh, that was really the only time, uh, that was, I don't think since then I put myself in a position to be cut, because I, you know, I got weak-minded, I guess, in that sense, and just didn't want to, uh, uh, I didn't want to have the face out again and have a face packing up my stuff and moving and that kind of thing. So that's uh, that was probably the worst the worst thing. Uh, when I got cut from making the cut, that was uh, <laughs> that was pretty bad too. But at the same time, uh, that, was, that was a battle, and I was ready to go home at the same time. So we parted ways pretty friendly there, and I was like, "All right, we're good. Thanks. I made it." Uh, Eight to forty-eight guys. That's good. I'm happy with that. All right, I'll take care. So now, uh, Mike Keenan was involved with that. And what do you think of him? Is how he dealt with you as a as a player in that show? Uh, yeah, it's, uh I got chirped nonstop by him. Uh, I remember seeing a clip one time of me in the net, and uh, you know I was getting lit up. It wasn't my day. 
And uh, he said, you know, I saw McQuinney go take a drink of his water bottle and there was water squirting everywhere from the bottle from all the cups. Eh? So, yeah, it was... Uh, a little Swiss cheese there, yeah, was it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a rough day for me. So I was pretty frustrated and I think I expressed that on uh, on camera on the show. But <laughs> that's, yeah, he was, he was, what was on his mind, he was going to tell you. Yeah. So it was, now, is it true he gave you a beach ball? No. A beach ball? You think he could stop it? <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, no, he never ended up doing that. I could have used one that day for sure. Now, moving into your pro career um, after you left the Spirit and you obviously did making the cut, um, what um, who do you think was your favorite coach that you've uh, had to play for in the last, oh. I guess it's what, eight years? Yeah. There's, yeah? Uh, wow. I don't know if I've had a favorite coach, if there's been one guy that I really uh, enjoyed playing for. <laughs> it sounds uh, it sounds strange, but there's never been a guy that I've really, you know, said, this is my guy, this is my coach. Uh, there's always been, you know, if I played on a team multiple years, I saw that coach for the first year being a good guy. And at that level, uh, people change all the time. And you know, I never grew to become 100% friends with any of them really it was uh you know they're kind of uh a take it for what it's worth friendship right uh you know they're trying to get to the next level on their own as well so it's uh I've never really had a guy that I kind of you know hung on to and was extremely good friends with uh I was extremely good friends with uh the head coach that's now in Huntsville and uh obviously he became the coach after that and you know it's a it's a different world to going from being good friends and uh you know i was there when his kid was born and uh and we played tennis all summer long and he transitions to becoming a coach and you know that relationship has to change because he has to be his head coach self and i have to be uh you know i have to be a player so it's uh it's hard to differentiate those two things and i just don't think our relationship worked out like that so so, you know, looking at our, our listenership that we have, and we're hoping we've got some young listeners out there or some parents that are trying to share some knowledge about the game, what what lesson or, or what experiences would you share with a youngster that came up to you and said, Dan, I want to do what you did. How do I go about it? What would you recommend? What would you say to them? Uh, uh, first thing I do is grab them by the shoulders and say, go to school. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, I, it's all work, you know. It's uh, how much you, you get uh, out what you put into it. And if you're not willing to put the work in, it's just not, uh, you know, you're not going to be successful. It uh, goes without saying with anything. Mm -hmm. You're not going to put the work in. It's not going to happen for you. Uh, you got to persevere. Lots of crap. Lots of garbage. Lots of different people you're not going to like. People you're going to love uh, that have to leave. Um, you know, you, you just, the adversity is going to be huge going through all that stuff. You see a lot of things change. You see a lot of different people, and it's that you, a lot of stuff you have to blend out of your mind and just blank and you know do your own thing. There's a lot of stuff that's gonna bug you and bother you, and not just being mentally strong. But I don't want to overwhelm any young kid with uh, too much stuff right now. But definitely, if you're starting out, younger guy, it's uh, hard work all the way. If you're not gonna put it in, you're not gonna get nothing else. So yeah. If you've got a good uh, foundation, then you can build from there. But uh, if uh, you're weak on uh, the mindset front and the body and all that, it's uh, you know, it's going to be <laughs> you make it a lot harder on yourself trying to be successful. So. Now, in the summer months, um, what do you usually spend your time doing? Fishing. <laughs> I do. Uh, I do a lot of work on cars and small motors and uh, detailing, and uh, I got a I got a big passion for nuts and bolts, I guess, in that in that sense. But uh, you know, any chance I have uh, to jump in a boat, grab a fishing rod, and go fishing, that's uh, that's it fall hunting for sure but uh fishing definitely 100 percent. put me on a lake put a rod in my hand and uh you know let me let me just float out there what's the biggest fish you've ever caught oh nothing i haven't you know i i caught a good eight pound walleye which is uh, a pretty big fish for a walleye and uh maybe a 14 or 15 pound pike but i'm still i'm still looking for my big monsters my uh my hidden beauty so Hopefully one of these days, but uh, yeah, I've uh, struck out on, on monster fish that have come to the surface and just my eyes widen up, but one of these days, I mean, uh, I'd say I've got to catch a big one one of these days, so. It's like getting a hole in one in golf, I guess. <laughs> yeah, 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 one of these days it's going to happen. Well, everybody, you're listening to CIWS. I'm your host, Mike Humphreys, the host of Hockey Talk, and we're at 102.7 Whistle Radio, 
And you can check us out on the internet at whistleradio.ca. We're the home and the voice of your Stovall Spirit Junior A Hockey Club. And our special guest this afternoon, the one, the only, Mr. Dan McQuinney we're in conversation with. Um, Dan, now, you know, looking forward on, you know, moving forward like this year coming up, you're moving to a new town. Um, what, what do they supply you? What, what is it, how does it work? Do you have to go and find your own hotel and pay your moving expenses? And like, what, what kind of things uh, do you have to deal with now as you move? Uh, basically, I mean, uh, the, the team t will take care of your moving costs. You know, you get reimbursed on all that. Uh, that's huge. You know, moving's never fun, and it's uh, it's taxing mentally and physically. So if you can, uh, if you can have somebody take away the cost of that move, it makes uh, makes it a little bit easier. Um, they uh, every year the team will supply you with uh, furniture. You know, it's never junk. It's always uh, they'll supply you with the apartment. Uh, they'll pay for the apartment for that eight months you're there. Uh, the uh, utilities, cable, internet, they take care of all that, uh, and then they, you know, they supply you with the furniture. So basically, you're taking taking care of your own bills, and and then uh, then you're also getting paid to play sports. So that's uh, that's also a plus. Right on. Now moving to uh, Mississippi. Whereabouts in Mississippi is it? Uh, it's South Haven. It's basically north northern Mississippi. Uh, it's right on the border of Mississippi and uh, Tennessee. You know, I'm a five minute walk from Tennessee. Really, I guess you could say from Mississippi. So, it sounds funny, but uh, I could drive thirty minutes and go through Mississippi, Arkansas, and another. St I don't remember what the other state is, and back into Mississippi. So I can, you know, I'm I'm right there to visit a bunch of different places. So. Across a bunch more states off my list. Very good. Um, what's your What's your biggest um, accomplishment? Do you think in your life that you uh, feel that that was something that you're pretty proud of that you worked hard towards? Um, I want to say doing what I've been doing now. Besides going to school, when I first started playing goalie when I was 16, I knew that I wanted to play hockey. You know if not getting a scholarship professionally and you know I'm doing it it wasn't an easy road and uh, I put a lot of work and effort into being able to go through and battle all the stuff I battled and uh, that it's uh, it feels amazing you know it's a it's a cool feeling to play a sport for a living you know so it may not last forever but uh, the novelty never wears off it's a uh, it's an unreal thing so I uh, I worked hard for it and you know it's a big accomplishment so what's your goal this year for your team? Uh, yeah, every year, uh, your standard, uh, I guess your standard media answer is, uh, you know, you want to win a championship and uh, every you hear every guy say that and that's just, that's your goal. And I want to win my third. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got two. First one was amazing. Second one was pretty good. Um, I'd like to have another championship. You, you, it, the first time when you... I think if you've never won one and you're an older in your career, you want to win one. When you're young, you don't understand what it's like to win a professional championship. And then when you do, all you want to do is win more. You, you get the party and the celebration and the parades and the people and the, you know, all that good stuff comes flying at you. And then, you know, it's over. It's over in two weeks. Uh, lasting memories. And then again, you want to, you know, you want to do it again. You want to relive all that stuff. So. That's uh, you know that and have a successful year. You know you don't uh, you don't stay in this business without being a, a good goalie. And well, obviously I fit the fit the part, but uh, yeah, you, you don't stick around. It's a business, and at the end of the day, is uh, if you're not performing, you're not going to be there. So right now, do you think uh, hockey has made you a more rounded person? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's hockey has been <laughs> like I said previous uh, previous recordings here. Uh, being around a guy like you, um, uh, being around a, a, all the different people I've met has just shaped me, you know, from uh, being, uh, I'd say, a pretty rough a rough cut kid uh, coming here, and then uh, I guess uh, all these years have been sanded up and uh, nice round pretty ball now, I guess you could say, but uh, everybody's... Uh, I don't know, there's not, there's not one, two specific people I can really hone in on to say, you know, that's who made 100% the difference. It, it, everybody's put their little piece in the puzzle, and, uh, you know, it's made me the person I am today, and, uh, uh, you know, it's given me some pretty good uh, positive attributes. And I think it's, uh, without hockey, I don't, I don't know what I'd be doing. I'd probably still be in the Sioux uh, working at the steel plant or something. I don't know. So right. it, uh, it definitely changed my life in a million different ways. What do you think hockey means to a young person today? 
Uh, you know, I'd hope it'd be, uh, you know, like a, a team. It still means that to me, uh, team, you know, being with, the, being with the boys, being with a bunch of kids, you know, having fun, you know, playing a sport. I think it's, uh, I would hope that's what it means. <laughs> what I think, I would say, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fun sport to play and you're with your friends and you're whacking a puck around and you, you run into guys and you wear the big gear and you don't get hurt and it's just a, a fun, a fun thing to play and I would hope that uh, I definitely, you know, I would hope that's what the young guys are thinking. Well, you played in Stouffville and I just want to use Stouffville as an example. What kind of pressure do you think around kids that are local that try to make the local team? Ugh. Do you think it was uh, harder on them than someone like you as an outsider? Uh, absolutely. I can't imagine what it would be like. Uh, it's, even for the coaches, uh, trying to take a kid on that's local because of the pressures that are on him to, uh, you know, everybody's watch always oh, from Stouffville and he plays for Stouffville. Wow, it's, uh, you know, that's a big thing. I've seen it through pro hockey to where guys uh, are from those towns and they take uh, they take the biggest heat from everybody for everything. And then they've, you know, they, they've grown up, say like a guy like Will Hockton, he grew up with the town. Everybody knew who he was, and uh, well, I saw, they, especially with his dad as well. But they saw a big time pressure to, uh, put towards him to perform, and uh, big pressure for the coaches to also take him, bring him onto the team, and that kind of thing. So it's uh, I I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> do you think people understand the game of hockey more now in comparison to days gone by? Uh, depends on where you are <laughs> in the world. Um, you know, when I'm in the South, it's uh, it's a different game. Uh, people uh, want to see fights, and uh, they the odd time would like to see a big save. So sometimes we uh, throw those out there, but it's uh, it, they want to see it rough in the South. Um, uh, in Canada, I want to say that they like the finesse of the game, and you know, there's still people that like the fights, but a lot of people like the finesse and uh, the talent of all the players, and that's what I think people see. That uh, I still I hope that too. <laughs> I hope people see that that that's uh, that's a big part of the game. The guys' talents and what they what they can do on the ice is something that not a lot of people in the world can do. So, now, who was the best hockey player you ever played with? Oh, tough question. Uh, I played with uh, guys that have played in the NHL. I played with uh, Daniel Gano. He played on a, a line with Wayne Gretzky in New York. So that was uh, he was pretty amazing. Um, last year, I played against a player. Uh, uh, Peter Dagenet, he played for Montreal for four years. I uh, played against him, and uh, he'd come across the blue line and take a slap shot, and uh, before he blinked, the mesh was already moving behind him. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of <laughs> he was definitely by far the best player. Uh, I watched him put a, a one timer in from the hash marks on the boards that was a pass from the blue line, and you look over and see him standing there. You're like, what's he gonna do from there? And uh, you know the pucks on his stick, and before you even think he's gonna shoot, it's uh, you know over your shoulder in the net. So that's he was uh, by far the best, the best player. So yeah. Now, do you ever do you think in in your whole career, it doesn't matter if it's minor hockey or whatever, um, was there ever a player that never got the recognition he deserved? Um, in your opinion, of course. In my opinion, like somebody who said, I can't believe they didn't take him. I uh, you know, I can't believe that they're not giving him an opportunity. I mean, he works hard, he skates hard, he's got a good shot, he's good hands, he's got the whole package. And it could be even when you're minor hockey days, Dan. Uh, you know, I've seen guys that I've seen that happen to. It's, uh, I don't even, you know, I can't remember half the guys that I've seen that okay. happen to, uh, to say, to mention names. Uh, you know, that's just a part of it. You know, it's, uh, sometimes it's what's meant to be is what's meant to be, and, you know, you got to believe in that a little bit, and that's just uh, that's just a part. You know, and not everybody can play where they want to play, and you know, if that's the way it was, and uh, everybody'd have a spot and everybody'd be happy. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, that's just a part of the game. It's uh, it's too bad, but you know, some guys get overlooked. Some guys, uh, you know, just don't don't get the recognition they deserve, like you said, and that's just you know, that's part of it. That's <laughs> who, who was the guy that found you up in? Uh... Northern Ontario there to come down and play for the Spirit. Uh, who you don't remember? Oh, Mark. Mark, no. John Mason. Ah, I'm sorry. Yes. Jimmy Mason's yes. uh, brother. John was Mason, a scout yeah. up our, that neck of the woods and uh, saw you play and uh, suggested that maybe you come down here and give it a try. That's, uh, yeah, you're correct. Uh, <laughs> it slipped my mind there. I started thinking about uh, people past him. Uh, but, yeah. Who was, your, who was the general manager up there for that team? I think the uh, remember his name. 
uh, might have been the coach. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, uh, St- Stanley Stu. Uh, Don't remember. That's okay. Bobby Spadoni. Yeah. Bobby Spadoni was the guy. Well, I'll tell you, he's a man of his you. word because, uh, unfortunately for Mr. Burroughs, our general manager uh, couldn't deal with a situation to get you yeah. to come here and, and sign the deal and. He gave me a dollar figure, what not to go over type thing, and try and get it less. And he was a man of his word because when I talked to him, he did not want one red cent because he said if Dan played for me for one year and had an opportunity to move on, he uh, would give that uh, you know uh, very openly. So we got you for nothing. Yeah, I know. So I, I don't know if that's a good thing in your mind, but <laughs> no, I didn't see. I wouldn't have seen the money anyway, so no. it didn't really matter. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Well, Dan, as we uh, wind down our uh, our little. Uh, question period here I've always got one question I'd like to ask everybody and uh, if given the opportunity of sitting down having dinner with anyone in the world from past history or maybe in the future for that matter who do you think Dan McQuinney would like to sit down and have dinner with uh, I guess if I had to say anybody I definitely have to say uh, Jesus no I'm just kidding uh, I would have to say uh, probably Jim Carrey would be my go-to guy oh, yeah? Yeah, okay. I think uh, I've always uh, if I was going to be an actor, that's who I would have modeled myself after. Uh, I probably modeled myself after him a lot in general, more some of the characters that he's played than anything. But, uh, yeah, he, he seems a little bit weird now, but uh, I'd more say if I could sit down with, let's say, his character Ace Ventura for uh, <laughs> for a night, I definitely, that would be uh, that would be something I'd want to do. So. Okay, Dan. Well, thanks very much for your time, everybody. Um, we are listening to, or you are listening to, CIWS 102.7 whistle radio and again you can check us out on the website at whistleradio.ca and we're the home and the voice of your Stovall spirit junior a hockey club now dan open concept here the mic is yours anything you want to say to the fans of Stovall? um i guess one of the biggest lines uh that i normally use uh it's kind of my go-to uh, just to leave off with is uh uh, don't cook bacon with your shirt off. That's uh, <laughs> that's my that's my uh, my gift to the world. So okay. don't ever forget it. Okay, Danny. Thanks very much. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye bye.